right, five of the seven of my previous videos have been about series that belong to Bandai in some shape or form. This week, I'm giving myself a break from Bandai and letting Warner Brothers and DC Comics have a chance at claiming my videos. <sighs> Two months in and already having YouTuber problems. The future looks bright! Anyway, we're not here to talk about how sad it is to be a content creator today. No. We're here to talk about one of the best and most influential animated series to date. Off of the success of the 1989 live action movie, Warner Brothers was looking to further cash in on the Batman craze. The WB set out to create a superhero cartoon series like none before it. Up until this point, Batman had only been represented in an almost complete opposite way in animation as compared to his comic book inspiration. On one hand, you could turn the page and see dark, violent comics that didn't shy away from blood and bashing in skulls, while on TV you got eyebrows, some stellar dance moves, and just plain silliness. From the crew of Steven Spielberg's Tiny Toon Adventures, Bruce Timm and Eric Radomski set out to create their own interpretation of The Dark Knight. Pulling inspiration from the recent movie's strangely timeless setting, i.e. Zeppelins, computers, TV, and cars, they managed to give the show a sense of both being old and new simultaneously, which means that the show is still more than watchable to this day. Paul Dini was brought in as a writer and became a prominent figure in the show, going on to fill most of the production bible for this Batman. The show's style was like American Art Deco, with the backgrounds being drawn on black paper, taking on a very noir look, which invoked the more dark detective aspect of the character. They also looked to the old Fleischer Superman cartoons for the animation's fluidity and simplistic design. For the musical score, just like in the 89 movie, they were able to get Danny Elfman's conductor, and they wrote a variation of the movie's theme for the show, and amazingly, each episode had its own original score. Any good animated series is half what you see and half what you hear. So we have a killer soundtrack, beautiful art style, and fluid animation. Now all we need is a stellar voice cast. The cast included such actors as Ron Perlman, John Glover, David Warner, and Arlene Sorkin. Batman himself would be voiced by Kevin Conroy. There is no other voice for Batman in my mind. Oh, and a little-known actor by the name of Mark Hamill would provide the voice for the series' most important villain, the Joker. This role was originally given to everyone's favorite murderous clown, Tim Curry, but he developed bronchitis early in production and had to pass on the role. What a world that could have been. The series aired on the fledgling Fox Kids on September 5th, 1992, and it was amazing. The show pulled no punches, in fact it showed them. Violence, mature suggestive themes, blood, disfigurement, abuse, and so on. This show was aimed at a little older audience than your typical cartoon of the time. Most cartoons of the era were centered around a toy line, and the show was made to reflect that. Not Batman, though. Yes, there were toys and merchandise, but that stuff was an afterthought. These guys had a story to tell, and they were determined to tell it. For the five of you out there that still don't know, Batman is the story of a normal human boy who loses his parents and grows up to fight crime. His only superpower is arguably the power of money. Quite possibly the best superpower. Yes, he is a normal man. Aside from an endless supply of money and only self-imposed burdens such as his butler and any young, naive sidekick he could dress in brightly colored spandex and throw to the wolves like a target while he skulks quietly in the shadows, decked out in dark colors so he's well hidden. He was a man with higher than normal intelligence and had trained himself to the peak of human ability. Whatever problems presented themselves, he always had the answer, and that answer was usually no further away than his tidy whities that he wore on the outside of his suit. Yes, his utility belt. What did you think I was talking about? This magical belt was filled to the brim with all sorts of goodies that had no right fitting into those little compartments. Gadgets such as lockpicks, gun-sized grappling hooks, gas masks, smoke bombs, batarangs, and even a shard of kryptonite somehow all fit in there at once. You know, with all that metal, grease, and even alien rocks, those bat cookies had to taste pretty gnarly. Ah, uh, Batman, like when we get to the bat cave, could I get a little snack? Yes, Shaggy, we'll all have a snack. Bat milk and cookies for everyone. Bat milk? 
because comics didn't exist in the world of Batman, at least not like they do in our own world, Bruce Wayne took his in-universe inspiration from the likes of Zoro. If you've ever heard of the character Zorin R, that's where it comes from. Now this is more from the comics, but just a fun little side fact. It's a mishearing of his father's last words that are used to trigger an unhinged side of Batman, an even more unhinged side of Batman. The phrase was actually, the sad thing is, they'd probably throw someone like Zorro in Arkham. This was also an alien back in the silly days, but that's neither here nor there. He set out to channel his needs for revenge into a symbol of fear for all ne'er-do-wells in the pursuit of justice. The animated series also breathed new life into characters such as Mr. Freeze, giving him a tragic origin and therefore making him a more three-dimensional character than previous iterations. This was such an impactful event that the origin was retconned into the comics, and it brought the character back from the dead. Other notable character changes were the designs of Two-Face and Clayface, being remodeled to more closely resemble their animated counterparts. The series also introduced a handful of new characters to the mythos, such as Detective Renee Montoya and the villain Lockup, who were so popular that they were introduced into the comics as well. Seems like I'm forgetting someone, though. Oh yeah, the character Harley Quinn was introduced in the animated series as well. Yes, that's right. The Joker's better half was intended to be nothing more than the animated equivalent of a walk-on role, but she was so popular that she kept coming back time after time, got way too close to Poison Ivy, and eventually found her way into the comics as well. The character is now one of DC's most popular characters in all forms of media, starring in multiple books, rivaling the likes of Batman and Joker in toy sales, and being what everybody wants to dress as for Halloween. Despite the controversy surrounding her character and the unhealthy relationship between her and the Joker. Don't you want to rev up your Harley? Vroom, vroom! <laughs> the series would last for 85 episodes, split into a 65-22 seasons, ending on September 15th, 1995. The later series was rebranded as The Adventures of Batman and Robin, to better show emphasis on the pairing of the dynamic duo. There were also a couple of feature-length movies made for the series. This would not mark the end for this Batman, though. Oh, no, no, no. This series was so popular and successful that it spawned its own DC animated universe, the best collection of DC material available, ever. After the original run, Batman and Company would see light again only two short years after the original animated series. The new Batman Adventures aired alongside Superman the Animated Series, moving from Fox to Kids WB. A direct continuation, Batman and Company would receive 24 new episodes, airing from September 13, 1997 to January 16, 1999. The show would retain most of its cast, but things looked a little different for our heroes. To some characters' benefit, and others, not so much. The art style was streamlined and simplified for budgetary reasons. Costumes got darker, chests got broader, legs became toothpicks, female shrunk, and the Joker? Ugh. After the new adventures, things got futuristic. Beyond was the edgy, future continuation of the series, seeing Bruce Wayne as the grizzled old curmudgeon who would act as a mentor to the new Batman, Terry McGinnis, and yell at the kids to stay off his lawn. This was the 1999 Batman, so they shot Gotham City way into the futuristic era of 2019. Well, at first, anyway. In the first episode, we see Bruce Wayne still fighting as Batman, but age and a failing heart catch up to him forcing him to hang up the old cape and cowl for good. Then we jump 20 more years into the future where Terry stumbles into the Batcave and gets thrown out. But eventually, Terry steals the Batsuit, and after some gritted teeth and some hashtag not my Batman, Bruce agrees to allow Terry to be the new Batman. The story is a continuation of the two previous animated Batmans, Batmen, Batpeoples. As a result of the futuristic setting, most of the heroes and villains are either retired, dead, 
locked up, or some combination. Batgirl, aka Barbara Gordon, takes on her father's role. There is no longer just one Joker, but a gang who paint their faces and such and call themselves the Joker Gang. No, not Joker Gang Gang, just the Joker Gang, which isn't much better to be honest. Yes, this Batman gets his own rogues gallery, but there are a few returning faces and references to the good old days like Mr. Freeze and Bane's Venom, now in nicotine patch form. And of course, Joker himself. Next in the DC Universe, we jump back in time canonically, but forward to the year 2001 in the real world with Justice League, a very watchable version of the team. Batman would be back to basics, though his costume took on subtle changes to reflect all three previous variations. This go around, he would share the spotlight with his super friends. Yes, those guys, but not like that. The show was intended to end after the second season, but Cartoon Network decided to keep it going. But with even more super friends on the team, they renamed the show Justice League Unlimited. But wait, there's more. Our dear beloved Batman would also make appearances in the fantastic Static Shock, and the Arkham series video games would take lots of cues from the animated series, complete with the first two having Mark Hamill and Kevin Conroy reprising their voice roles, and Paul Dini writing the scripts. The animated series also had a comic book running alongside the show, but also massively outliving it, lasting until 2004, and only cancelled to make way for the upcoming animated series, The Batman. Nothing before and nothing after has captured the heart of the comics like Batman the Animated Series, a show set right in the era of story built around toys and pulled punches. Yet Batman didn't do either. It was made to be timeless and has definitely accomplished that goal. If you're so misfortunate that you have never seen the series, do yourself a favor and go watch it. If you're any sort of fan of Batman, or animation for that matter, you will not be disappointed. Thank you so much for watching. I have been a potato, and I appreciate everyone sticking around after having to miss last week. Had so many things going on at once and had to do some car repairs. I'm already working on next week's video, so hopefully that doesn't happen again. If you like this video, please leave me a like and a comment. If you're new here, or for some reason just missed that part, be sure to hit that subscribe button. I appreciate every one of you, and I will see you next week with another video. And remember, I am Vengeance. I am the Starch. I am Spudman! <laughs>